Good morning, each one, and welcome again to our service this morning. It's good to see many come out, and as we gather together again, and to worship our Lord and Savior, our risen Lord and Savior, what a privilege it is as the body of Christ to gather together in such a manner, and to encourage one another, and to sing together, to pray together, and as we will later today, to fellowship together, and meal and in, in games and we trust that you've planned to stick around for that if that works and looking forward to uh, having a good time there. But as Will mentioned, we are in First Peter again. It's been a little while since we've been in this epistle but we are excited to get back in and as we read the text this morning, First Peter chapter 3 verse 18 and 22, I will be honest and say the excitement wasn't always at the top (laughs) as it could be. It it is a difficult text. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, Because they formerly did not obey God, or when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So in reading up on our text this morning, commentators seem to agree with the difficulty that this passage often brings. For example, Wayne Grudem states, the meaning of this phrase is much disputed. Edmund Clowney in his commentary notes that Peter's words were no doubt clear to those who first heard them, but they have been hard for later generations to understand. In Martin Luther's commentary on 1 Peter, the popular reformer wrote regarding our text, A wonderful text is this, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the Testament, so that I do not know for a certainty just what Peter means. I cannot understand, and I cannot explain it, and there has been no one who has explained it. So if you really want a confidence booster, (laughs) read, read statements like that before entering into a text. But it is no lie then. Last week, Pastor Mike asked for prayer, and he prayed for this text because it is a difficult one, and it is considered a more challenging one in the New Testament scriptures. And so it has been my prerogative to approach God's word then in humility, and hopefully as always with a humility that helps prepare to speak what the Lord has wants us to hear this morning. I did wonder... As I was preparing, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, Peter writes regarding the Apostle Paul's writings. Peter says there are some things in them, in Paul's writings, that are hard to understand. I wonder if he had considered this portion of Scripture that he had previously written. That it too may be difficult to understand. But this does support what Clowney mentioned, that it was no doubt clear to those who first heard them because he does not offer a whole lot of extra explanation. And so we assume that his initial readers would have understood what he is saying, and therefore he's building on a point using these statements, and he's not seemingly throwing random thoughts together, but he's building on a theme. He's building on his main point, and that's what we then want to dig in and find out. It is with that confidence that in mind that we can seek to dive into God's word this morning, assured that we too will then be able to glean from Peter's inspired writings. For all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. These things said, we approach our text this morning again looking for a pattern of thought or doctrine that will be to us profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, or for training in righteousness. And to do this, we must back up a bit again, not only due to the fact that it has been a while since we have been in 1 Peter, 
but also to establish context and flow of thought that Peter had when he penned these verses so many years ago. And so we want to look back and take a broader view approach snapshot to this text because what, what we see here in verses 18 to 22, Peter is, is wrapping up a portion of scripture that he has written. So it's not necessarily the best scripture kind of as a standalone text, but we must understand it more from the broader snapshot overhead view of what Peter has been addressing And so in order to do that, if we come to a difficult text, it is sometimes helpful to back our view up a little bit and try to grab that that, uh, 20,000 foot view, so to speak, and to see what kind of themes are, are we addressing, what's been happening, what's been going on in the context of Peter's writing. And a few themes that we note that have played out throughout the series in 1 Peter our subjection and submission. That was a popular section there in chapter uh, 2 and into the uh, first part of chapter 3. As well as suffering, trials, persecution. First then, we are called to submission. In chapter 2, verse 13, we read... Be subject for the Lord's sake to every institution, human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. So we're to be subject to governing authorities. 2 verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. We are to be subject to masters. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold and jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God and used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham in calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. We see this theme of submission and subjection highlighted by Peter. And though submission in a sinful world will often lead to great difficulties because of our Christian faith, we are to submit in these spheres of life even if and when they lead to trials, persecution, and suffering. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, we read, In this you rejoice, this being this living hope. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, Though it is tested by fire, may be found to the result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We see the guarantee of temporal trials, but we are to reco- uh, called to rejoice in the hope of the gospel. Chapter 3, verse 8 through 17. We continue. Finally, all of you have unity of mind. And I'll just to back up a little bit here. As we've seen, we've talked about the guarantee of suffering. We, we look at, at the, the trials of, that submission will often bring and subjection to different authorities. And, and we haven't done a deep dive into those here, but those are in the previous services and sermons that we've done. And we see how Peter has been addressing that and, and how these things will often result in hardship. But he's also constantly giving us these reminders of how to live. How to respond during those times. 
And in verse 8 through 17 of chapter 3, he says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and to do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And that brings us into the first verse of our text. And so we start to see, hopefully, and I I trust a little bit of a, a flow and a pattern that we're seeing as Peter is bringing this together and he's, he's addressing a lot of real life situations and struggles that the church at the time had. And he's giving them practical advice and doctrinal counsel and encouragement and pointing them continually to the gospel. And here in this text of passage that we just read, he is exhorting us to live in a godly manner, even in light of the sufferings that we face. You see, how we respond in trials can be a great witness to our professed faith or it can do great damage if we are unwilling to act with humility in light of the sufferings that Christ faced and how he responded to those who persecuted him. Our behavior, our attitudes, our responses to hardship and trials will either be an honor to the Lord Jesus Christ because of the strength of the witness, but it can also do damage to the reputation of the church and to ourselves if we respond in unjust ways as well. As Peter has been addressing here, how to respond to authorities, how to respond to unjust masters, how wives and husbands are to respond to each other. So we're seeing not only the addressing of these um, themes, the submission and suffering, but we're also seeing a clear indication of, of Peter's desire for the church to live in a godly light, in, in, or in a godly manner in light of the suffering and the trials that they are facing. We just read in verses 13 to 16, Peter emphasizing the necessity of how we are to respond in light of suffering for righteousness' sake. And so imagine for a moment living in a time when there is a lot of persecution on the Christian faith. And there are times and places today as well where this is very real. And the church is suffering beyond probably what we have experienced in our location in the world and in our community And the church is suffering at great lengths. People's lives are at risk. Martyrdom is common at this point. And Peter's writing during a time when the Christian faith was really being attacked and simply professing a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ could cost you your life. And so he's given much practical instruction And how to live in these different spheres of life. But he's also continually pointing to the hope and the example that we have in Jesus Christ. Christ suffered. He suffered. He set an example. Christ suffered uh, unto a point of death. 
How many of you have suffered to the point of death? If we can answer it, obviously we haven't, right? But this is our Savior, and this is the example in the, that He has set, that He has suffered to a point even unto death. The only perfect, sinless human being that has ever set foot on this world suffered and died for sin. He was killed by his own creation according to the plan of God. And this is the hope that Peter keeps pointing his readers to as they are toiling through the trials of life and he, the purpose of these trials to, to sh- uh, shape us into the likeness of Christ, to transform us, to sanctify us. But we read the first priority we have in times of suffering in the passage, uh, verse 8 to 17 that we just read, is to honor Christ the Lord as holy. This is what we do when we suffer. This is what we do when life gets hard. This is what we do when we're hurt. We honor the Christ. We honor Christ the Lord as holy. Our word translated as honor comes from the same Greek word that we get the word sanctify. From which it means to make holy or to make clean or to render pure or to regard and venerate as holy. In our context, we are to honor Christ by setting him apart as the sole focus of our worship, our adoration, and our exaltation. How many times isn't that one of the biggest difficulties we face? We've had a hard week, a hard week at work, a hard week in the family, a hard week in church, a hard week wherever it may be. Is our sole focus during those times to honor Christ the Lord as holy? To worship him and place all our adoration and exaltation on him. I don't know if we can even do that perfectly. (laughs) But it just shows our need for the Lord Jesus Christ and his grace and his mercy continually as we fail in doing these things. But we know that he is worthy. And the more we learn to do that, the easier and more uh, obscure our trials and our hardships become. Because the glory of Christ becomes more and more real in front of our eyes every day in all we do. And the hardships and the sufferings become smaller in light of that. And when we look at those who cause harm and suffering, we lose our focus on Christ. And we lose our focus on His Lordship over our trials, our persecutions and sufferings. Rather, we should focus our sights on Him, on the eternal blessings that He has promised, and we honor Him in His perfection and glory. And with our hearts set on Him, we are more eagerly submit ourselves to his sovereign will and purposes, which in turn produces courage, boldness to face the darkest of trials and our deepest of sufferings. Having our our heart's eye set on him puts everything else into a dim background and we focus on him. And so how does this honoring Christ play out practically? Peter says, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks. Honor Christ by explaining the Christian hope. Honor Christ by exalting him, by proclaiming the hope of the gospel when we are faced with suffering. Encourage others with the glory of Christ. How does the world respond to suffering and how does that contrast with the instructions that we've received from Peter in this epistle so far? We respond differently because the hope that we have in Christ, our hope in chapter 1 verses 3 to 9, just to outline, our hope is imperishable. It is undefiled. It is unfading. It is kept in heaven 
and it is guarded by the power of God. This is the hope that we Christians have, and this is the hope that should be evident in our lives, even during those times. And this is what Peter is encouraging the church, that though they are suffering to the point of death, Be a light in the world, for the light that shines through you is the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel and the hope that he has given us. An imperishable, undefiled, unfading hope. But brothers and sisters, that hope is guarded in heaven by God himself. He is the one who secures that hope for us. And he is the one that no matter how much we struggle and how matter, and I think of the first song that we sang this morning, that even when we come complaining, and I can't quote it word for word, but to the throne of grace, he hears us. And he intercedes for us. In short, our hope is the message of the gospel. The good news of our salvation which spurs us on to godly living living, even in the darkest of nights we cling longingly to the promise of morning. We have a hope to for all who ask we are able to proclaim that hope and we are to live in such a manner that that hope is evident in our lives and we do not lose focus on our ultimate goal. Peter also says in verse 16, we are to have a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. We are to have a good conscience because we will be slandered and our good behavior will be reviled against. That is the expectation that we have as Christians. Our conscience, one commentator defines the conscience as divinely placed internal mechanism that either accuses or excuses a person, acting as a means of conviction or affirmation. The conscience, however, is not infallible and is also affected by sin, therefore it must be trained. It must be informed by the highest standard of truth, which as we know is God's word. An improperly trained conscience can lead even the most earnest believer contrary to God's word. And too often, Christians justify faulty understanding or even obedience by the standards of their ill-informed conscience. Since our conscience holds us to our highest perceived standard, Christians must set that standard according to the ultimate source of truth, which is God's word. Brothers and sisters, you must fill your minds continually with the word of God and the things of God as found in his word, so that when you face unjust suffering, when you face trials and temptation, when you face persecution and hardship, which you will, you will be able to respond and defend your hope with a good conscience, free from the burden of uncertainty or guilt. When you are slandered or reviled or spoken evil of or threatened for your good behavior in Christ, your conscience, being informed by God, will affirm your message your acts of righteousness, and in return, those who slander and revile you will be put to shame. The accusations of the world will ultimately be proven false and will prove to be their own condemnation for their unjust treatment of those who are obedient to God's will. God will not be mocked, and His timing, all unrepentant evildoers will face the eternal weight of His wrath, and God will ultimately vindicate His people and bless them with eternal reward. And so when we look at this, it is so easy. Now let me try to bring this all together again, moving into our text this morning. It is so easy to be tempted to respond and retaliate to unjust treatment, to to rulers, to governing authorities, to, to spouses, to masters in the workplace. It is so easy to want to retaliate, to defend our good name to vindicate our reputation. We're probably all guilty of that. But Christ has laid out a way, an example, when he was uh, 
persecuted and tortured and suffered and died, how did he respond? With humility. Because ultimately, we know we will be vindicated through the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not told to resist submitting considering the difficulties we face or that this submission may even produce. We do not resist submitting in the areas that God has called us to submit. In both submission and suffering, we are called to follow Christ's example in his humility. For in the end, we too will be vindicated with him. And this is what Peter is getting at in our text this morning. He employs the literary feature known as escalation, which is defined as a line of argument that builds toward a climax of some kind and functions to heighten the impact of the message of the text. So when something is escalated, we start low, and as it builds, it builds up to a point of climax, and we see that in Peter's writing in the text this morning in verses 18 through 22. Follow with me again in our text. For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in them a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. We start our passage with suffering even unto death in verse 18. We move to... Christ being alive in the spirit in verse, at the latter part of verse 18. In verse 21, we see Christ being resurrected. In verse 22, he is gone into heaven. And in the latter part of verse 22, all things are now subjected to him. So we see Peter escalating his narrative here from a point of suffering unto death to a resurrection and Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of God with all things being subjected under his feet. And so Peter is drawing our focus to an eternal glory and vindication with Christ over and above our temporary sufferings in this life. We endure even through difficult subjection because Christ endured. And now all things are subjected to him and so for you, brothers and sisters, for believers, we have an ultimate hope knowing that we will share in the reign of Christ in glory and therefore our sufferings are but temporary. They are but dim in light of the glory that awaits for each one who has placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his gospel. And so we ought not to lose hope of the light of them. Sorry, in light of them because our eternal reward awaits. Verses 18 to 22 is not that believers imitate Christ's sufferings. We have already established that. We are to imitate Christ in how we suffer in our willingness and response. But that is not what Peter is uh, suggesting here. Instead, it assures them that Christ has overcome death and reigns victorious over the forces of evil. The way of suffering leads to glory and divine vindication. And by implication, followers of Christ will tread the same path confident that he can lead them on a path that he has trod himself. And so we hopefully see a little bit by covering some of the themes that we have, that have uh, been our focus leading into this text this morning, how Peter is building from that as he writes this. He hasn't abandoned the themes and encouragement and the hope of the gospel that, that he has been talking about, just to kind of fit in a few statements about random things. But he's building on that. 
And we have spent quite a bit of time already this morning establishing the context and identifying these themes. So now we know what Peter's point is. And so we have to, and so we have set up our guardrails, so to speak, in a difficult passage to keep us from getting lost in some of the language that we see in our text. And with that, I have divided our text this morning into four points. And yes, the introduction was the longest section, so we're not just starting now. But I've divided it into four points. And as we saw on your outline, the title of the sermon, From Suffering to Vindication. And I believe that is the main point that Peter is making. He's drawing his reader's attention to the suffering of Christ and ending in the vindication of Christ. And we see that growth in this text. And the first point in verse 18, we'll be looking at Christ's salvation. Our second point in verses 19 and 20, Christ's proclamation. And in verse 21, Christ's demonstration. And in verse 22, Christ's vindication. So verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. The first thing Peter does, as we have seen before, is he directs our focus back to the gospel of salvation. This salvation that Christ has purchased for us and bestows upon us. At the heart of the gospel is the fact that Jesus Christ, the righteous, died for sinners, the unrighteous. Jesus Christ died for sinners. He triumphed through his undeserved suffering by providing redemption. We see a purpose in the sufferings of Christ. God had a purpose in that. And likewise, we can be assured that God has a purpose in the sufferings that we face. And Christ's sufferings ultimately led to the redemption of his people. Christ suffered once for sins, being put to death in the flesh. Christ, the sinless one, suffered in that he was put to death for our sins. He never had a single sinful thought, not a single sinful word or deed. He was and is perfectly holy, but he died to pay the price for sin. The only sinless man to ever have walked the earth died because of sin. The prophet Isaiah tells us in chapter 53, verses 10 and 11, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Much can be said on this verse alone. But for the sake of time, this morning we want to focus on the first step of the escalation that we mentioned earlier. And the timing is quite well I will be preaching our Good Friday service this year and have decided to rather than dig too deep into this verse today, it is such a great platform to preach from on Good Friday regarding the death of Christ and the purpose of his atoning sacrifice. And so we don't want to spend too much time looking at the aspects of the penal substitutionary atonement that we see here, propitiation, expiation, and those things, we will dig into that in a few months' time. But we see, for Christ also suffered. The conjunctions that Peter uses here, also and for, point readers back to the previous passage that we read, verses 13 to 17, and reminds them that they ought not to be surprised or discouraged by suffering. Since Christ also suffered and triumphed in his suffering, even though he died an excruciating death on the cross, he was put to death in the flesh, speaking of his physical life ceasing. And so we see why it was important to establish that context 
from the previous passage. Because that is specifically what Peter is pointing back to in this uh, passage when he starts. For Christ also suffered. He points back to the suffering that we have faced and reminds us that Christ suffered, that there's a purpose. When Christians suffer as a result of their faith, even unto death at times, we remember that Christ also suffered and was put to death. But we suffer and ultimately die physically because of sin. Christ suffered and died as the righteous for our sin. We die because of sin. Christ died for our sin. So even when we are sinned against, we are to have a heart and mind of humility and submission because we actually deserved it. We've earned death. Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. We have earned death because of sin. Christ, on the other hand, died in our stead, taking our sin upon himself. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the great exchange, our sins for his righteousness. Our sins placed on Christ, his righteousness placed on us. Christ also suffered the righteous for the unrighteous. Our sins are imputed to him, his righteousness is imputed to us. Because of Jesus' life, his suffering, and his death, we can stand before a holy and just God and be counted as righteous because we are in him. Our lives are hidden in Christ. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. Christ was put to death but made alive in the Spirit. And we have been raised with Christ and we have been hidden in Christ. Brothers and sisters, do you know what that means? It means that on that day when you stand before God in judgment, He sees the righteousness of Christ. As imperfect as we are and as imperfect as we are even trying to live righteously as Christians, we fail And because God is holy, all sin must be punished. And brothers and sisters, he has punished that sin. He placed it on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he nailed it to a cross. And then he raised Christ up to newness of life. And for us, when we die to sin, we are also given life in Christ Jesus. And we are placed in Christ. And we bear the righteousness of Christ. He has given that to us. What a bargain. He took our sin and in exchange he gave us his righteousness. That is the hope of glory that we have. That no matter what, we will stand before God. If you are a child of God today, you will one day stand before God cloaked in the righteousness of Christ. And God will look upon you and he will see the work of Jesus Christ. What a gracious God we serve. What a glorious gospel. The good news that has been given to us and the hope that we have that we can be found perfect in Christ. And so when we struggle and we fail and we falter and we respond even unjustly to unjust suffering or we maybe unjustly treat others, go to the Lord and repent. He has paid for that sin. It is covered. It has been washed by the blood of Christ. And he is eager to forgive. Our God loves to forgive sin. So much 
that he gave his only son to die for sin. Go to him when life is hard. Go to him when you are suffering. Go to him. And he will comfort. He was put to death in the flesh, Peter writes in verse 18, but made alive in the spirit. MacArthur writes on this passage, made alive in the spirit, or on this phrase, it is a reference to Jesus' eternal inner person. The Greek text omits the definite article which suggests Peter was not referring to the Holy Spirit, but that the Lord was spiritually alive, contrasting the condition of Christ's flesh, the body, with that of his spirit. His eternal spirit has always been alive, although his earthly body was then dead. Thus, Peter's point here must be that though Jesus' body was dead, he remained alive in his spirit. Christ died, but his spirit lives. And likewise, when we die and we, our spirit leaves our physical bodies, we are still alive in the eternal sense. But Christ died, his body was dead, his spirit alive, which also obliterates some of the views, more progressive views today, that Christ was only in a coma, that he wasn't physically dead. The contrast was that Christ died and his spirit was made alive, but in his spirit, and this brings us to our next point, the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So his spirit was absent from his physical body. His spirit was somewhere else. And here in our second point, I've entitled that Christ's proclamation. So we saw Christ's salvation, and now we're seeing Christ's proclamation. So this, his spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, we're in verse 19, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. This is where some exegetical difficulties come into play with this text, but we want to be careful and consider how what Peter is saying in these next few verses builds upon his greater themes and helps his readers to understand so that we look again at what Peter wrote and ask, so, sorry, so, so we look again at what Peter wrote and ask a few questions of the text. What did Jesus do? He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. When did he proclaim it? While his physical body was dead and in the tomb, and he was alive in the spirit. To whom did he proclaim it? The spirits in prison. Who were these spirits? Disobedient spirits from the days of Noah. And so even in those two verses, we've gleaned quite a bit of information, again, that helps us move forward. And we see that Jesus went to a specific place, during a specific time, and he proclaimed a specific message to a specific group. So these aren't broad doctrines drawn from this on on demonology or anything like that. This was a very specific place, time, message for a specific group. The verb translated in our text here is proclaimed means that Christ preached or heralded his triumph. In the ancient world, heralds would come to town as representatives of the rulers to make public announcements or precede generals and kings in the procession celebrating military triumphs, announcing victories won in battle. That's what a herald would do. They would would go before the convoys. They would go before kings and leaders and generals. And they would proclaim the victories. They would shout of the goodness and the victories that were won. And they would herald this before the king would come. And so the message would be carried through and people would be excited. People would know and if you were opposed to the king, you would dread that your ruler had lost and that the enemy had won. So this verb is not saying that Jesus went to preach the gospel. So what he proclaimed to the spirits was not the gospel. Otherwise, Peter would have likely used a form of the verb euangelizo, which is the Greek word meaning to evangelize. That is the word to proclaim and to preach 
the gospel that is used in the New Testament. Christ went to proclaim his victory to the enemy. He was heralding his triumph, his victory to these spirits. He went to proclaim his victory to the enemy by announcing his triumph over sin, over death, over hell, over demons, over Satan. But these were specific spirits that he proclaimed his triumph to. The spirits that were in prison from Noah's day. We know that demons are still very active today, so these are not the ones Peter is referring to. These are specific to those that were imprisoned in Noah's day. And we see a little bit in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 6. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So we see Peter again speaking of these angels, these demons, these fallen angels. When they sinned, they were cast into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness and to be kept until judgment. So these spirits are not the demons that are tormenting the world and the, and the church today. Jude also refers to to these spirits in verses 6 and 7 of Jude. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in sexual morality and pursued unnatural desires serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So these angels again, these fallen angels, these demons, these spirits that Christ is proclaiming to, they are kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the day of judgment. But Jude compares this just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. This gives us another hint of who these spirits were and what they did. The demons or spirits that Christ proclaimed his triumph to were those who were disobedient during Noah's time. And it is noted on this that the spirits defied God by leaving their spirit world to enter the human realm, just as Satan did in the Garden of Eden. These spirits were drawn to females who they saw as beautiful in some perverse and lascivious way. These demons entered men's bodies, as is clear from the children who were born from those unions. And though the children were human, there was a pervasive influence on them from the demons. So much that the people were open to demons shows that the evil of man at, at that time. Those wicked, demon-possessed men then produced a generation that was nothing but corrupt inside and out and needed to be destroyed. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, starting in verse 1. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. The sons of God here refers to angels. The sons of God is a title because when a child is born, a child is born through procreation from man, man and woman. Sons of God means that these were beings that were directly created by God. So they, these are not humans that he's speaking of. It is a reference to spiritual beings and in this case to these angels. So the sons of God, the angels, these spirits, saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives and they, any they chose. When the Lord said, then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. 
when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land and the animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Those wicked spirits were sent to prison in chains because they overstepped the boundaries of God's tolerance. They filled the earth with their wretchedness to such an extent that not even 120 years of Noah's preaching convinced anyone beyond his family to repent and believe in God and escape his coming judgment. Since that time, the demons who committed such hyena sins had been bound and imprisoned when Jesus died at Calvary. Sorry. There's a bit of a mistake in my writing there, so I apologize. Since that time, demons who committed such hyena sins have been bound and imprisoned. Perhaps by then, they thought they had lost the upper hand over them. But such was, you know, was, uh, here it is. Speaking of Christ, when he died at Calvary, by then, these demons may have thought that they had won. That Christ had lost the upper hand over them. You see, Satan's attempt ever since the promise of a child that would bruise his head, or he would bruise his heel and he he would crush his head, this Messiah, this Redeemer, Satan has sought to destroy the line through which Jesus is to come. He sought to destroy all the babies when Jesus was born. And ultimately, through the crucifixion, they thought that Christ was dead. And that they had triumphed. Instead, Christ appeared to them. After his death, and the demons would have probably celebrated to a point, Christ appeared in their midst and proclaimed his triumph over them. He is not pleading with them to repent. He is not pleading with these spirits. He is going to them and he is proclaiming his triumph. In modern language, we might say it is the ultimate cosmic mic drop. These demons now had no doubt that they were doomed for eternity. Christ heralded, heralded sorry, his triumph to them, to these demons who were the worst of the worst, so much that these are kept in chains and gloomy darkness. Colossians 2.15, through the Christ's death and resurrection, he, that is God, disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. Peter's point is clear. Believers will suffer for the sake of righteousness. For doing what is right, but suffering believers can be encouraged that this is not the end, but rather the path to victory in Christ Jesus, who suffered for us, but also conquered sin and death and hell in our place. And he proclaimed this message triumphantly to the worst of the spirits. This salvation is pictured or as I have stated in our outline, demonstrated in verse 20, the latter part of verse 20, 
in verse 21. And bear with me as we continue to dig through some of these verses and look at the details and facts therein. But in verse, the latter part of verse 20, Peter says, While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Christ here is demonstrating his salvation. Chapter, uh, point number three, Christ's demonstration. And demonstrating it with the example of baptism. Baptism, which corresponds to this, Peter uses a phrase here, corresponds, is translated from a phrase which means to copy or to counterpart or figure pointing to. It is the word that is used as an antitype. An antitype is that which fulfills a type, which is exactly that. It is a copy, something portrayed previously in the Old Testament that is now fulfilled in the New Testament. And that is what Peter is saying here. Baptism, which corresponds to this. Baptism is an antitype to this. Well, what is this? He's making this transition to the salvation found in Christ. The preservation of the ark of those who believed in God is an analogy of salvation that believers have in Christ. This is the picture that Peter is drawing from Noah. This verse isn't a treatment of the Christian ordinance of water baptism, which Peter makes clear in his statement. It is not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But rather, just like Noah and his family were saved from God's judgment by being in the ark, Christians are saved from judgment by being baptized into Christ. Not by water, but just as the flood immersed all the people in the judgment of God, yet Noah and his family passed through safely, so also his final judgment will involve everyone but those of us who are in Christ will pass through securely. So the baptism which now saves us is not a water baptism ordinance, but it is being placed in Christ. As we saw earlier, we are hidden in Christ. That is what saves us. And that is the picture that Peter is drawing from Noah. As the ark was floating, these righteous, the few found righteous were placed in the ark, and they were protected from the waters of judgment. They were protected from the wrath of God that sought, as we read in Genesis 6, to destroy the earth. And so likewise, when we are baptized into Christ, we are protected from God's judgment because of Christ, and we are in Him. Romans chapter 6 <laughs> Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism. So what is this baptism speaking about, that, uh, this reference that Paul is making here? Being buried with Christ. We were baptized into his death and we were buried with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So if we are baptism, so this is what our baptism signifies. We died and are buried with Christ. And the miraculous part is the resurrection of Christ, which we too are partakers of, and he gives us newness of life. So we are died and buried with Christ, and we are given new life. And that is what I believe is what Peter is talking about here. Not so much the ordinance as it is our salvation. Just like Noah and his family were saved by being in the ark, we are saved by being 
in Christ. God provides salvation because a sinner is baptized or immersed into Christ's death and made alive again in his resurrection, not because of any ordinance including water baptism. And just to be clear, that is something that that text has often been used for in certain denominations. When Peter says baptism now saves you, it is used to defend baptismal regeneration. That water baptism gives salvation. We do not believe that, for our salvation is not of works, but we believe this passage to be referring to our salvation, being baptized into the death and burial of Christ, and then being raised to newness of life with Jesus Christ. And this baptism is not the removal of dirt from the body, which is a reference to being washed in water. So it is not that, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. On this phrase, one commentary writes, an appeal is a technical term that was used to make uh, contracts. Here it refers to agreeing to meet certain divinely required conditions before God places one into the ark of safety, which is Christ. Anyone who would be saved must first come to God with a desire to obtain a good, cleansed conscience and a willingness to meet the conditions, repentance and faith, necessary to obtain it. Water baptism does not save. It is the Holy Spirit's baptizing the sinner safely into Christ, the elect's only ark of salvation that forever rescues the sinner from hell and brings him securely to heaven. So again, just like Noah and his family were secured in the ark and saved during an extremely wicked time, we too are secure in our salvation for we have been baptized into Christ Jesus. We too see how Peter has built on our text the suffering and death of Jesus Christ but which resulted in him going and proclaiming triumphantly to the spirits, the wicked spirits in prison from the time of Noah, which he then uses to point again to our salvation by referencing this baptism, an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so he's building on this triumphal journey Suffering, death, alive in the Spirit, proclaiming triumph to the Spirit, being saved through, uh, in Christ through, f- through judgment, being saved because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this Christ, who only a few verses before, was dead and in a tomb is now resurrected. He is alive again. He has proclaimed his triumph over the spirits who would have been rejoicing over his death. And he has proclaimed his triumph in their face, directly to their faces. And he is now resurrected. And this is the ultimate triumph of Christ's suffering for believers and the pledge of triumph in their own unjust suffering. As we follow Christ's example... In suffering, but he is also taking us on this journey of vindication. He will exalt us with him. And that brings us to our last and final point Christ's vindication, verse 22. Speaking of Jesus Christ, in verse 22, 1 Peter chapter 3, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. The very ones that were responsible for his suffering, for his persecution unto death, have now been placed into subjection under him. And Christ, who only shortly before this we see laying in a tomb, a place for dead bodies, has now been raised to the right hand of God. The ultimate place of prestige and power, a place of honor, that is where Christ now sits. He went from the tomb to this place 
of glory at the right hand of God. His work, his redemptive work on earth is finished. And he rules from there today. Brothers and sisters, this is our Savior. He is the one who is ruling from the right hand of God, from his throne of glory. He is ruling the earth and all things are subjected to him. And if all things are subjected to him, we also know that if we are in him, all things he can work for our good. As Paul says in chapter 8. 8 verse 28 of Romans, all things work together for good for those who are in Christ Jesus and who are called according to his purpose. How do we know that he can keep that promise? Because he is at the right hand of God ruling over all things and all things are subjected to him. This is our hope. This is what Peter is pointing us to. Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11 Therefore, this is right after Christ's example of humility and how he took on flesh and became man and he suffered, he emptied himself, he died, and he rose again. And therefore, verse 9, chapter 2 of Philippians, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every name should knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth. All angels, all humans, all demons, all things will bow to him as the ruler of all, as he has conquered death. And every tongue, verse 11, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is where Christ is now. He is in heaven ruling with all things having been made subject to him. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 1, verses 3 to 6, write, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as his name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For of which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. This is our Savior. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the victory that he proclaimed to the spirits in prison as they await their final judgment and be cast into the lake of fire. This is the one in whom we are baptized. This is the one in whom we will be placed and be carried through the wrath of God's judgment because we are found secure in Christ just like Noah and his family were secure in the ark. This is our Savior. And what Peter says here in verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him, echoes Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, where Paul writes, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. This is the Lord Jesus Christ in his vindication. He has been exalted to the right hand of God the Father and is above all things. Brothers and sisters, this is the hope that we have in our Savior. When life throws its curveballs at us, its hardships, when things are difficult, when we suffer, when we are sick, when we face death, when we grieve, when we do all these things, brothers and sisters, we have a Savior that 
who has given us his righteousness and is currently sitting at the right hand of the Father with all things subjected under his rule. And he loves you. And he cares for you. And he intercedes for you. When you do not know what to say, Christ is interceding for you. When you do not know where to turn, Christ is praying for you. This ruler of the universe is our brother through salvation. God the Father does not even call the angels sons, and yet if we are his child, we are his sons and daughters. This is the hope that we have, and this is what I believe Peter has been pointing to in this text as he has reminded and dealing with the trials and the themes of suffering and subjection and the suffering that that brings, he is pointing them not only to Christ as an example in suffering, but he is showing his readers the hope that is found in this. Why? Because as we follow Christ in his suffering, we too follow Christ in his exaltation. And one day we will be exalted with him for eternity in glory. We have seen Christ's suffering, his death, his resurrection, and now the ultimate vindication of Christ in his position of honor and supremacy over all creation. Christ was vindicated and you shall be too. Christ was vindicated and you shall be too. Christ saw a great reversal of fortunes and so shall you. From suffering to resurrection, Christ submitted himself to the Father And now, all things are subject to him. We see that change in his power and glory. Let us draw hope and encouragement as we follow in his footsteps, as we seek to serve him as his children on this earth. And let us never lose sight of that hope that is found in the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you again for your mighty word, for the power of your word and the truth of your word. And God, we think this morning of the hope that we have in you, Lord God. I pray that you would help each one of us to draw encouragement from that. I pray that you would be with each one who is suffering, who is struggling, Lord, that you would help them to place their focus on this eternal hope, the weight of glory, Lord, and that that might ever cause to diminish the trials and sufferings of today. Help us, Lord, to treat others in such a way, knowing that with the same humility and kindness that you responded to your persecutors, that we would do so to others whom we deem have maybe wronged us. Help us to respond in repentance when we have wronged others. But always, Lord, as a result of having been placed into you, Jesus Christ, into your death and being raised to newness of life with you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.